Hello, I'm Chris Morosky, and this video is titled Cervical Cancer, and it is part of our Health System Science Conference Series. Let's begin by reviewing the goals and objectives of this video. Contrast causes of postcoital bleeding by age group. Describe the workup and staging of cervical cancer. Discuss treatment options for early stage cervical cancer. Use an understanding of health system science to create solutions for known barriers of accessing preventative health care. We'll start off by meeting our patient, D.L. The patient is a blank year old Hispanic, nullagravid female who presents with a three months history of bleeding after intercourse. She reports this bleeding as spotting to a light period, which lasts for a day or two after she has sex. She has no pelvic pain or pain with sex. What is your differential diagnosis for her postcoital bleeding? More specifically, what would be your most likely diagnosis if her age was 15 years old, 35 years old, or 65 years old? All right, in the next slide, let's review our differential diagnosis for this patient. It is important to think about the differential diagnosis for this patient based on her age. Let's look at it by age group. If this patient were 15 years old, the most common causes of postcoital bleeding would be cervicitis, vaginitis, ectropion, or trauma. For a patient who's 35 years old, it may include some of the previous items, but would also begin to include endocervical polyp, cervical dysplasia or cancer, and complications of contraception, specifically IUDs or effects of the hormones on the endometrium or the cervix. And for a patient who is 65 years old, we want to include the diagnosis of atrophic vaginitis, as this would be the most common cause of her postcoital bleeding. All right, let's go on and learn a little bit more about our patient, DL. So it turns out, DL is a 35-year-old nullagravid female with postcoital bleeding. Her histories are as follows. Her previous obstetrical history is that she's never been pregnant. Her previous gynecologic history is that she's never had a pap smear. And maybe she has a history of an STD in her teens, but maybe she cannot fully recall this, and she has normal periods. Her previous surgical history includes a right hemipelvis fracture after a motor vehicle accident at age 19. Since that time, she has been wheelchair bound. Her previous medical history, she denies. She reports that she takes ibuprofen as needed for occasional pain. She has no known drug allergies. She smokes half a pack per day of cigarettes for the past 12 years, and she drinks two to three servings of alcohol per week. She uses no drugs. She is Spanish speaking only, and she works in a laundromat. Her family history is that her brother had lymphoma as a child. What are your next steps in this patient's management? After perhaps taking a little bit more of an HPI and reviewing her review of systems, you'd want to move on to her physical exam. Let's see what her physical exam shows. Here's the physical exam for our patient, DL. On physical exam, DL is found to have vital signs of 5 feet, 7 inches tall, 138 pounds. Her blood pressure is 112 over 68. Her heart rate's 82, her respiratory rate's 18, and her temperature is 98.8 degrees Fahrenheit. On general appearance, she's alert, oriented, no apparent distress. She arrives in a wheelchair and needs assistance with moving to the exam table and moving into the lithotomy position. On cardiovascular exam, she's regular rate and rhythm with a normal S1 and S2. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, and non-distended. She has no guarding or rebound. On pelvic exam, she has normal female external genitalia. On speculum exam, she has a normal vagina. On her cervix is a fungating mass, which is bleeding to the touch. This is non-tender. The next slide will show an image of her mass. Here in this image, you can see on speculum exam, a large fungating mass taking over the cervix. There is bleeding noted from the cervical mass, which results from the speculum alone. While you may have considered a pap smear and performing some cervical swabs to screen for STDs due to this patient's postcoital bleeding, given the fact that she has this large fungating mass on her cervix, which is concerning for cancer, you'd want to perform a biopsy. A biopsy is then performed of the cervical mass in this position. The next slide will review the histopathology. On histopathologic examination, you can see the biopsy result in this image. To the top left, as indicated by the red arrow, is the normal, non-keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix. To the right, we see the invasive squamous cell carcinoma. 
this cancer has invaded down all the way to the level of the stroma and is beginning to create a desmoplastic response, which is a pervasive growth of dense fibrous tissue around the tumor. Okay, you've now diagnosed DL with invasive cervical cancer. What are the next steps in her management? It is very important to note that cervical cancer is staged clinically. This is the only gynecologic cancer that's staged clinically. The reason this is, is that cervical cancer is actually one of the most common cancers in the world. And not all countries have the resources to perform diagnostic imaging, such as CAT scans or MRIs. Staging has traditionally been a combination of physical exam and small diagnostic camera procedures. However, it is important to note that in more and more countries, there is increased access to imaging. And for early stage cervical cancer, imaging is perhaps more reliable than physical exam. So since cervical cancer is staged clinically, let's look at how you go about doing that. The basics of this include the following. You'd want to perform a complete pelvic exam. This would include a speculum exam, a bimanual exam, and a rectovaginal exam. What you'd be looking for is extension of the cervical cancer to the vagina, the uterus, or the parametria. Next, diagnostic cystoscopy and proctoscopy would want to be performed to rule out invasion of the bladder or the rectum from direct extension of the cervical cancer. In terms of imaging, an intravenous pilogram was the traditional imaging used. This could rule out an occluded ureter. Blockage of the ureter from a large cervical cancer is associated with an advanced stage of the disease. Where there is access to further imaging, CAT scan, MRI, and PET-CT can all be used to rule out positive pelvic lymph nodes. The presence of disease spread to pelvic lymph nodes would change the treatment options related to the patient. Okay, so let's go on and see what has happened to our patient, DL, in terms of completing her workup. Here are the results of the complete workup for our patient, DL. On pelvic exam under anesthesia, she is found to have a 3.2 centimeter mass on the cervix with no involvement of the vagina, uterus, or parametria. On cystoscopy and proctoscopy, there is no invasion of the tumor into either the bladder or into the rectum. A CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast is performed. It shows a 3 centimeter mass arising from the cervix. There is no local or distant spread seen. There is no inguinal, pelvic, or abdominal lymphadenopathy seen either. Combining the results of our physical exam, biopsy, cystoscopy, proctoscopy, and CAT scan, what would be the stage of our patient DL cervical cancer? For all of the GYN cancers that we will review in this video series, looking at these tables on staging can be a bit overwhelming. For our patient DL, we are talking about early stage cervical cancer, so we're going to stick with the top three boxes here in this table. Looking at stage 1 disease, stage 1 gets broken down into stage 1A and stage 1B. For stage 1A, this is invasive carcinoma that can be diagnosed only by microscopy with a maximum death invasion of less than 5 millimeters. So basically, this is not a cancer that can be seen on exam. This does not apply to our patient DL. Stage 2 cancer involves invasion beyond the cervix and the uterus. Stage 2a is involvement limited to the upper two-thirds of the vagina without parametrial involvement. And stage 2b is involvement to the upper two-thirds of the vagina with parametrial involvement, but not to the pelvic wall. Our patient DL does not have this advanced disease. What we see is that our patient DL has stage 1b disease. She has invasive carcinoma measuring greater than 2 centimeters and less than 4 centimeters and is limited entirely to the cervix. DL's cervical cancer stage is 1B2. For a young patient with stage 1B2 cervical cancer, what treatment options do you discuss? In the next slide, we will review the treatment options of early stage cervical cancer. Here are the treatment options for stage 1B cervical cancer. The first option is modified radical hysterectomy, and this is the preferred treatment for stage 1B2 and 1B3 cervical cancer. Radiation therapy, including external beam and brachytherapy, can be offered, but this is usually reserved for poor surgical candidates as it does not have survival rates as good as modified radical hysterectomy. There is a discussion around fertility sparing surgery for young patients who have not completed childbearing. This can include procedures such as conization of the cervix 
and tracheolectomy, which is removal of the cervix alone. However, this is reserved for patients with cervical cancer stage 1A1 up to stage 1B after discussing the risks and benefits of disease recurrence and mortality of choosing these less aggressive surgical treatment options. So it turns out for our patient DL, she elects to undergo modified radical hysterectomy. Let's talk briefly about what we mean by radical hysterectomy. In this image, you can see that there are basically three types of hysterectomy. This actually can get broken down a lot more, but that gets more complicated. Let's just stick with what's here. There is a subtotal or super cervical hysterectomy, total hysterectomy, and radical hysterectomy. Let's look at them individually. In a subtotal hysterectomy, only the body or corpus of the uterus is removed. The cervix is left behind. This is almost never performed when dealing with gynecologic malignancies. Next is the total hysterectomy, where not only the body of the uterus, but also the uterine cervix are both removed. This is much more common with gynecologic malignancies, and it's much more common in modern practice in the year 2020. Finally, we show here a radical hysterectomy. This is the type of hysterectomy that is performed for cervical cancer. You can see that in a radical hysterectomy, the body and cervix of the uterus are removed, but also the parametria and upper portion of the vagina are also removed. It is easy to see that for a cancer that is arising from the cervix and grows by extension into these tissues, removal of them would allow complete removal of the cancer. Importantly, a radical hysterectomy does not involve removal of the ovaries. Our patient, DL, could undergo radical hysterectomy and maintain her ovaries for use for in vitro fertilization in the future if she so desired, and also for some hormonal production following her surgery so that she doesn't enter into surgical menopause. All right, let's see what the histopathology results are for our patient, DL, after she undergoes her radical hysterectomy. The histopathology report contains the following. A uterus with cervix containing a 3.2 centimeter invasive squamous cell cancer extending into the middle one-third of the cervical stroma. No vaginal or parametrial involvement. There is positive lymphovascular space invasion. In terms of her pelvic lymph nodes, 0 of 16 removed nodes are positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma. This is a very positive histopathologic report for our patient DL. She has a small cancer which is limited to the cervix and there is no vaginal or parametrial involvement. However, she does have some risk factors including invasion into the stroma of the cervix as well as lymphovascular space invasion. This makes her intermediate risk for recurrence of her cancer and therefore she be recommended to go on and have additional treatment. Alright, let's go on and see what the adjuvant treatment was and the outcomes for DL. DL does well from her radical hysterectomy. After discussing additional treatment options, she undergoes external beam radiation to the pelvis. She has no complication from this treatment or her surgery, and at her last visit, three years following the surgery, she continues to remain without any evidence of her current disease. While this is a positive course for our patient DL, what changes to the healthcare system could have prevented this patient from developing cervical cancer? We will touch briefly here on health system science, which is the third pillar in medical education, following the basic science and the clinical science. There are six core domains in health system science, and they are healthcare structures and processes, healthcare policy, economics, and management, clinical informatics and health information technology, population health, value-based care, and health systems improvement. A focus on which of these six core domains could have helped our patient DL obtain preventative health care and perhaps have avoided her invasive cervical cancer diagnosis. To my eye, looking at these three following core domains of health system science could have helped prevent DL from developing cervical cancer. Healthcare structures and processes, healthcare policy, economics and management, and population health. Let's see how this applies to cervical cancer and cervical cancer screening in America. Cervical cancer really is considered to be a preventable disease in the United States of America. With pap smears, HPV testing, and HPV vaccination, cervical cancer has become one of the more rare cancers in America. In fact, there are only approximately 10,000 new cases of cervical cancer per year in America, with 3,000 deaths from cervical cancer each year in America. Importantly, after positive HPV status, 
not having a pap smear is the single biggest risk factor for developing cervical cancer in the United States. It's even more risky than smoking tobacco. So why did our patient, DL, develop cervical cancer? Well, most likely, DL had barriers to accessing care. The two obvious barriers here are that she is a non-English speaker and that she is wheelchair-bound following her motor vehicle accident. Let's briefly review two publications from the literature that support changes to the healthcare system that would have broken down the barriers to accessing care for our patient DL. In this first paper, Limited English Proficiency and Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening in a Multi-Ethnic Population, published in 2005, Jacobs et al. showed that women who report not reading or speaking English at all, or women who report reading and speaking English less well than any other language, are less likely to receive breast and cervical cancer screening than are women of the same race ethnicity who read and speak only English and another language equally well. They also showed that these differences were not explained by socio-demographic factors, contact with a physician or hospital, U.S. nativity, or number of years residing in the United States. As you can see in Table 2 here, for the patients who spoke no English, only approximately 10% of them received pap smear testing, clinical breast exam, and mammography. Furthermore, for the women who spoke another language more fluently than English, this was even less. This is at approximately 3% for all three of these screening exams. Both of these are in comparison to women who speak only English or English in another language equally well, with approximately 40 to 50% of women receiving pap testing, clinical breast exam, and mammography. These authors concluded that communication barriers to adequate health care among women who cannot speak English well contribute to the observed differences in receipt of breast and cervical cancer screening. In a separate publication that also applies to our patient DL, Ramjan et al. in Barriers to Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening for Women with Physical Disability completed a review and highlighted the following. Physical barriers were the most recognized and widely reported barriers that hindered access to health care for women living with physical and or functional limitations. The most frequent physical barriers were having difficulty gaining access to health facilities, offices of health providers, and to medical equipment used for screening, such as mammography machines and examination tables used for pap smears. Okay, putting this all together, what could possibly be some health system science solutions to patients like DL to help them access preventative care and avoid invasive cervical cancer? Here are some possible suggestions for health system science solutions for our patient DL. Healthcare facility with ramps and elevators transfer lifts, and exam tables with motorized lifts. Assistance with transportation and parking, given the fact that she is wheelchair bound. Furthermore, ensuring that there are Spanish speaking staff, certified interpreters, and interpreter phones present in the office or clinic. Also equally important would be providing information and messaging in Spanish, including plans for follow up. Balancing the cost of these health system science solutions with the cost of the burden of disease on society and the impact on individual patients shows us that investment here could make significant impact in our patients and in the cost of our health care. All right, everybody, that was quite the whirlwind, and we're going to wrap it up here by reviewing our goals and objectives. Contrast causes of postcoital bleeding by age group. Describe the workup and staging of cervical cancer. Discuss treatment options for early stage cervical cancer and use an understanding of health system science to create solutions for known barriers of accessing preventative health care. All right, I think we did a great job of covering all those objectives. Thanks for watching this video. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Mm -hmm.